Good morning, everybody. Here we are with Country's Bicker Chicago, Touching a City Soul. We are learning the first mimer in the Safer, and we are in it. Baruch Hashem. We are on page 61. 61. Yeah. Okay. We're on page 61. Amazing. Okay. So here's where we are. So basically what we've said so far is that um, the Pasuk begins by explaining that trust in Hashem and do good, and therefore you are dwell, well, the Pasuk doesn't say that, trust in Hashem and do good, dwell in the land and be nourished by your faith. But what we're saying is that the first two pieces is what we're meant to do. It's a... Uh, instructions and cautions we should trust in Hashem and do good and therefore um, yeah and that that will guarantee us a life of tranquility meaning dwell in the land meaning you'll be settled in the land and you'll be nourished by your faith which got us kicked off on this whole discussion first of all about why is it that we're talking about betachen first you know betach ba Hashem the asetayv and so we're talking about betachem first, and then at the end it says vera muna. Yeah. So we'll be we'll be nourished by our faith. So why is it that betachem is first? The Ramban talks about how somebody who has betachem obviously has a muna. <laughs> for you to have betachem, you have to obviously have a muna. But for someone to have a muna, not necessarily I mean that they're going to have betachem. For someone to know that Hashem exists, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to actually trust Hashem. Um, and so then we started on this whole thing and the Rebbe Rasha brought this whole concept that, oh no, sorry, before that we explained that Amunah is meant to be, we're talking something that's really hard, you really have to work on it, as I'm sure we all know. Um, and, but Amunah, you know, you kind of just get yourself sparked up and that's it, you, you're, you're all inspired and all fine and dandy. But meanwhile, the Rebbe Rasha says Amunah is something we have to feed and sustain. And so therefore the Friedrich Rebbe started explaining what does it mean to feed and sustain something. And so we spoke about it in regards to our bodies. We have to eat and drink in order to maintain the bond between something spiritual, which is our neshama, and something physical, which is our guf. And we understood what it means to feed and sustain something. We have to actively take care of it, not just, you know, the more, the, the, if we neglect our food and our eating, then therefore we're also neglecting our spirituality. So, so too with emuna. If we neglect feeding ourselves with with the proper things to maintain emuna, which is to really work on ourselves both spiritually and physically, to have more of a sensitivity for godliness, to do more, learn more Torah on a regular basis. You know, just like you don't just eat once a week. You, you shouldn't just learn once a week. It should be a, a, a regular learning. You should be constantly feeding and sustaining that, um, both physically and again, spiritually, making that point that not just, you know, open the book, but also actually really focus on it. And the more you focus on it, the way that Mimer explained is the more you'll be able to be refined, to be able to appreciate more and more and more. So somebody who may not have learned the Mimer in a long time, if they're making this effort, to spend half an hour every day or whatever listening to the shear. So then you're going to get better. You're going to, you know, be working out that muscle and you'll be able to focus more strongly on a mimer. You'll be able to have more skills on a mimer. So that's feeding and sustaining. Then we went into this whole discussion about Moshe, Moshe versus Avram, comma, Avraham. And the fact that Moshe, when he was born, his neshama came full, perfect, uh, pristine was not affected whatsoever by the process of going through Seder Stalshlus, which is amazing and incredible. Because even Avram, who we love, admire, he is, you know, Avram Avinu, he's our father, he's the, 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 the first patriarch. Even his neshama is compared to its afar, its, its dust and, and, uh, and ashes, compared to the source of his neshama in, in the tzilis. So we're saying that that as much as Avram, in his full greatness, he's a chariot, literal chariot for the Hashem. He had no will of his own other than whatever Hashem wanted him to do. Even that Avram, his neshama was in a certain sense, you know, tired out or not, I wouldn't say diminished, but it was, it was affected through the process of Seder Ishtalshus. Um, whereas Moshe's neshama was actually perfect, pristine, went straight down. And, um, and we're going to learn what that means, how that 
you know, what, how does that affect us as a whole? So now, as part of learning how his neshama being perfect and pristine coming down affects us, now we're having a discussion about what these two types of neshamas. There's Zera Behema and Zera Adam. So there's the neshama, Zera Adam, which is a neshama that comes from Atzilis, which I think, here we go, I have our little diagram. Right, so this is Atmos, Atmos, uh, which is infinite, Hashem had a desire. He created something that's finite to connect to. And therefore we have Kesser, which is this like half infinite, half finite situation going on, which like is beyond comprehension and it's incredible. Um, and so therefore began the process of creating finite out of infinite, which is kind of like a funnel. Again, this is not a physical representation, as I've said a million times already, but just something for us to visualize um, so it's kind of like a funnel and there's like steps, 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 steps from taking infinite, slowly more finite, more finite, more finite, more finite into the point that like now I literally, I hold a water bottle and I hold the Friedrich Arbus picture and it's separate things, you know, is as, as much as it's all made out of Hashem Plato, so to speak, they hold separate, they seem as if they're separate entities. So Azera Adam is a neshama that originates. The essence of the neshama comes from Atzillus. And when that neshama comes down, it may, just like Avram's neshama, it may go through a process, you know, of traveling distances and therefore it's affected by the travel. But at the end of the day, they have more of a natural capacity to have sensitivity for godliness. Just as we spoke about Wi-Fi, right? That my head, my brain doesn't have a sensor for Wi-Fi. It just doesn't. And so therefore, as much as the Wi-Fi is literally going through my brain, that's a whole different discussion about whether that's healthy or not, but um, it's literally, you know, all these radio waves are traveling right through my brain, but my brain doesn't have the receptor to feel it. So someone with an ashama from that source in Atsilis, it's a Zer Adam, it's a seed of Adam, it's a seed of a man, ha, not a man, but men, man, woman, um, it has this concept, this ability, this like inner sensitivity for godliness. So they are in a certain sense able to sense, you know, as, as we've seen from incredible stories that I told yesterday of the Friedrich Rebbe, sorry, of the Alter Rebbe, and how much more so. I mean, we see incredible miracles of suddenly the Rebbe knew things, you know, like I was just reading, um, I, I tell my kids different stories for Mr. Shabbos in the afternoon, Shabbos afternoon. And one of the stories a few weeks ago was, oh, was about Rab, um, Rabbi Dr. Manuel Shochet. And how when he was young, he was so insistent. He had just come to Yeshiva here. He wasn't exactly a Lubavitcher, but his uncle was a Chodakov. Then they convinced him, they convinced his parents to send to send him to study here in the Lubavitch Yeshiva. And he had just come probably like two, three months before. And um, he wanted, he was insisting, and he's a, I don't know if you guys have ever heard him argue, or not argue, debate or whatever. He's a very, very strong personality. And even as a young boy, he was insistent that he wanted to be a counselor in a camp. And he wanted to go to camp. And, and uh, the entire Hanhala of the school said, you know, it's probably not such a good idea. Like you just came, maybe get settled into your study, especially in Lubavitch. Yeshiva here at that time, I think even now, um, the, you know, the Yeshiva studies goes into the summer. So he, he insisted, insisted at the end, they said, okay, you have to ask permission from the Rebbe. So he walked into the Rebbe and he, with his uh, strong will, even as a young boy, he said, I want to go. And they had a back and forth and the Rebbe never said, don't go. The Rebbe just kept pointing out different things to think about what he should think about. Never said, never said, don't go. But in the end, so, the, so this boy goes, ah, it's lost. He said it in, in, uh, in Yiddish. I think it's for Fallen, I think. Um, and the rabbi laughed and he said, no, it's, it's, it's found or whatever. You, can, you guys can read it. It's a beautiful story in the one by one. I think it's called the newest book from Jem. Bottom line was when he came back, he actually had a miserable time in camp. It was absolutely miserable. He hated every moment of it. And when the rabbi welcomed him back, because his birthday was right after, he arrived back, and so he came in for Yechidus for his birthday, and the rabbi said, so new, was all the argument worth it? And he knew that the rabbi somehow knew that he didn't have a good time. He didn't know how the rabbi knew, because he didn't tell him. He didn't tell the rabbi. 
but somehow the Rebbe knew. And there's all these different stories that the Rebbe, you know, at a Ferengan, for example, the Rebbe, you know, at some point meets somebody's eyes and you could feel that like the Rebbe knows exactly what's happening in that person's head. So this sensitivity for spirituality, for something deeper than just, you know, what we see with our own eyes, a Rebbe has that, a Rebbe has that, a, a, a neshama that whose source, it's from Matzillas, has that sensitivity. And so therefore we're able to understand and, and we're going to delve deeply into this. What's the difference between Azar Adam and Azar Behema and how that brings us to Das? And again, we forbring about Das um, very much in depth. Okay, also just pointing out, Shmon Esrei, we actually, one of the brachas we ask for is Das. And so it's interesting to, when you, when you daven Shmon Esrei, Mitzvah today, or if you, if you haven't yet, um, to have that special kavana when you're saying, you know, that bracha about asking for Das, to have that das, to have that sensitivity, because we can work on it, to have that sensitivity for godly things, for, for spiritual, you know, for having a, a chush, a taste, a, a, a feeling for godly things. Okay, so now we're discussing how this person, how a person who lives with this sense of das is able to even understand it and feel it in his own body. He's able to feel his nefesh in his body. I personally don't. I feel when it's going out because I'm hungry and I feel when it's, uh, you know, but I don't, I don't necessarily feel like, Oh, this is, you know, my nephesh is actually making my hand move and my nephesh is making my eyes be able to see it. You know, all these different things. I, I don't, I don't have that sensitivity, but, but somebody who, who has that sensitivity, somebody who's, who's Neshama, who's Zara, Zara Adam, who's Neshama come from Matzilis, does have that sensitivity of, of that bond between the two. And so therefore now we're bringing in this comparison to someone who's passed away. So therefore, we're on page 61 on the top. And therefore, um, no, one second. Let me, let me start in thus, in the pre previous page, page 60. Thus, even though one cannot actually see the nature of the nefesh, how and what it is, he nevertheless feels his nefesh, his life force, by seeing the vitality of his body vitality that comes from the nefesh. So being the fact that he's able to feel his, his vitality in his body, he's able to have that sensitivity to the nefesh in his body. And therefore, when a person dies and the nefesh leaves the body, the body is left like an inanimate stone. Even while a person is alive, the level of vitality of his soul is not the same all the time. So as much as we're alive and it's not always the same, we don't, we can't necessarily, I speak for myself, maybe you guys can, I can't necessarily tell the difference when my nephesh is really, you know, in my body and my nephesh is less in my body. Because we see that there's different times um, when, when there's different levels. For example, when a person is asleep, his nephesh leaves his body and only a very basic modicum of life remains in his body. All his important faculties are not revealed as they are when the person is awake, right? So we know that. We know that when we're awake, we can't necessarily, as it says here, including, for example, the faculties of intellect, sight, and hearing. It's, it's, we can't necessarily, we don't think straight, you know, sometimes as it's, it's uh, the comments, you know, you could imagine a, an elephant going through the, the hole of a needle, right? So it, it, that's dreams. It's, it's. It, it may not make sense intellectually. Not only that, but we don't always hear. We can't, we obviously can't see. Even uh, my son woke up last night and he needed to, you know, go to the restroom and his eyes were open, but I could, t I could tell he wasn't really there. Like I, wa I helped him go to the bathroom and helped him walk back and he was able to see, but you could tell he's not really there. He's still half asleep. And so too with hearing. For this reason, in a dream, two utterly dis desperate things can become conjoined. So two things that are completely separated that don't, don't make sense could actually become conjoined. And while one is asleep, it appears real and reasonable to him. This is possible because during sleep, the light of the intellect does not illuminate one's consciousness and enables the person to discern the impossibility of those two disparate things coming together, right? So as much as if we were to wake up and say, what, that did not make any sense. But in our dream, because our nefesh, the, the light of our intellect, is not actually illuminating our intellect to such an extent. So therefore, 
we're not able to contemplate whether it makes sense what we're, what we're going through in our dream. However, upon awakening, the person is astonished that those two incongruent things could be conjoined in the dream. This occurs because on awakening from sleep, the conscious functioning of his soul returns and illuminates his individual faculties. Conscious awareness, das, right? We said this, das of godliness, of godliness operates in exactly the same way in the soul of Attilus, souls of Attilus. It is written, from my flesh I perceive God, even though no thought, quote, no thought can grasp it at all. This refers to his essence, which is ungraspable. However, his existence can be and is known and felt. To borrow an example used by our sages, we see that the worlds are compared to a great body. They are alive and endure. Their vitality is from Hashem's infinite light constantly flowing into them at, a, at every single moment. This concept can be understood by all. Okay, let me continue and then I'll give a summary of what we said as a whole, just so we don't lose the train of thought. However, when this concept connects with a person's soul so that he bonds with it and actually feels it as if he sees it, this is called Das. Regarding this, our sages declare, who is a wise person? One who sees what will be. The simple intent is that one who sees the future consequences of his conduct. However, Chassidus focuses on the term what will be literally, what will be born, and explains that the phrase mean, means seeing the genesis from the four worlds from their origin. It is as if he can see what his actual eyes, what, oh, sorry, sorry. It is, it is as if he, he as that, ugh. it is as if he can see with his actual eyes the emergence and creation of existence from absolute nothingness. Okay, so what are we saying here? So just like somebody who's asleep, his, his, his vitalizing soul is not necessarily fully embedded in the body. A person could technically, you know, some people talk in their sleep, but that talking is not that person talking. It's not that nephes really going through the intellect and deciding what words are going to come out and all of these things. They are partially away, and that's one of the reasons why we know we wash our hands in the morning because the part of our neshama left and part of the neshama came back and the impurity of, of missing that neshama is what remains in our hands. So we wash Neglavasar. But we know this very clearly that a certain part of our neshama doesn't, you know, doesn't remain with us. And so therefore all these things seem to not make sense. So too, where, where we're able to, to realize that in ourselves, we're able to see that when we're asleep, part of our vitalizing soul is not there, so too someone with a Zara Adam, with, a, with that, you know, in the Shama from Attilas, is able to sense that godliness in other things, not just also in themselves. It says, from my flesh I perceive God. They're able to sense that. They're able to sense when their neshama is, is strongly embedded in their body and when their neshama is not so embedded in their body. And this, as much as, it, as we said here in the Mimer, as much as we can't understand, and we said this in the, in, um, let's see, Mr. Kayla also, that we can't understand Hashem in Atmos. We have no relation to infinite, but we can understand certain parts of Hashem in Seder Ishtalshlis, and we can understand Hashem's existence, in, whatever, Hashem's creating force or whatever um, in our world. So there is a certain sensitivity that we're able to have, even though Hashem's essence in his, you know, infinitude, can't be grasped, we can grasp certain aspects of godliness. And so therefore we have, we are able to, to somebody with such, a, with such a neshama that has that das, that sensitivity for spirituality, is able to grasp how much their neshama is embedded in them and how much it's, you know, external and not connected and, you know, all these different things. They have that sensitivity to know um, on a more constant basis as opposed to just when we're asleep and when we're not asleep. And so therefore, somebody who's able to, um, someone who, who has this das is also able to connect to, is able to connect to where the source of everything comes from. So as we said in the last paragraph, it says, who is a wise person? One who sees what will be. So on the one hand, a wise, that, that means, for example, and I, I always talk about this and the, the Rebbe discusses this in, in, um, 
in, di in different letters that how do you know where something is coming from, right? There's a famous question is, you know, is this coming from a Nefesh Bahamas, Nefesh Lekis, Yetahara? Like, where is this coming from? You think, you see what will be, where, where it's going to lead me. At the end of the day, when I put my head on my pillow, am I going to be proud of this action? Am I going to be proud of this speech? Am I going to be proud of this? Or is it going to be one of these things like, oh, it was just the entryway into like, Yetzir Hara taking over my life and, you know, put me down, put me in a negative space, uh, encourage me to say Lashon Hara, encourage me to waste my time, etc., etc. So that's one interpretation. One interpretation is who see what will be, meaning what will come out of my actions, what will come. But Chassidus here is focusing on the fact that somebody who's wise is also from the perspective of, is able to see what created this. So as much as we may see separate entities, we may see a safer, right? We may see a Siddur, we may see a separate book, we may see me and my phone and you know the, 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 the water bottle and they all seem separate. But someone with real, who's, who's, who's in tune to spirituality, to godliness, can see that the Avister created every single one of them, can see where it came from, can see as it says here, um, explains the phrase meaning seeing the genesis for worlds from their origin, every single aspect of the world. And as I said yesterday, it's all here, right? So just the fact that I was able to say that Atsilas is in this room, I'm sure we can appreciate, have more appreciation about being careful about our sneas, even in, in our bedroom or even in, you know, random places in the house, because we realize that Silas is there. It's the same, it's the same, right? So having that sensitivity of where things come from, having that sensitivity and, and knowing chassidus and learning it and understanding godliness can help us see how our world, which seems separate, full of separate entities, really all comes from one and it's really all together as one. And it gives us a, a chush, a, a feeling, a sensitivity to godliness. Um, and we're able to see as if with our actual eyes, and again, this is, something we work towards. This is something that for Zara Adam is, is, is easy and simple, so to speak. It's, it's, it's innate. They're able, they have this uh, Wi-Fi receptor to be able to see these things, whereas we need to work on it. We need to work on create, building and creating that DAS, and we're actually on the next ice. Um, yeah, in the next ice, we're actually going to work, we're going to discuss how we can work on building and creating that DAS. And this mimer has, let me just double check. Pretty sure it's only six. Yeah, six. Yeah, it only has six. So we're, we're, we're over halfway and we're Mitzvah Shem going to build, we're going to work on building that da so we're able to have the sensitivity and live our lives with this mindset, with this, you know, Hashem glasses. We're able to live our lives and see the perspective of the world and see, see the world from this perspective. And I hope this was clear. And let me see how we're doing. Yeah, perfect on time. If let me okay, I can't wait to see you guys tomorrow in there, Tasha.